Sally, can you hear us? Um, Richard, we've got them on Joe's computer, which is okay. Well, we can me. we can certainly see them from Joe's computer if we if we've got Sally. I'm not sure we've got Sally now. Yeah. I've just shared my screen. Can you see it? Yeah. So we've got the images on. We just need Sally. Okay, I've unmuted myself. I got great. muted there. Well, we can hear you. So. Okay, great. But oh, okay, so if I just start, but if we could just close that down for a second, because we have got a little video, I think, Anne Marie, that you're going to show. But I'll, let me just introduce myself, and then we'll show the little video, and then we'll come back to this. Is that all right? Yeah. We'll, we'll give it our best yeah. shot. That's fine. <laughs> you should Thank have you. your video ready to go. Okay, okay. Well, it's been absolutely wonderful. I really enjoyed the presentations. I have to say at the outset, I'm not an artist. So please, no expectations from that. I'm coming it to from the point of view of somebody of living on the River Thames. So, Tuesday the 30th of March, Tower Bridge, London. High tide, 1600, height 7.35 metres. I used to live on the Thames in the centre of London on a section of the river known as the Pool of London, which runs from London Bridge to Lime Kiln Creek. This area that once lay at the heart of London's maritime uh, trading empire is now home to a small community of river dwellers. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. That's great. Um, my lasting memories of the mooring are dominating by the power of the tidal Thames and how it shaped the it's how it shaped our daily lives. I'm currently at the University of Plymouth writing a PhD about the relationship between river dwelling, the river, and the built, built environment along the banks of the Thames. One of the highlights has been collecting people's thoughts how the tides shape their daily routines living in the city on the water. The following short clip was pre-recorded last week by one of the members who live on the moorings and it just gives a slight flavour of the difference in tides and what it's like at high tide. So I don't know if you can play that now please Joe. The tide in the city. For 2,000 years, the Thames has played a crucial role in the heart of London. It has been a gateway for travel, trade and maritime life. Its tides are amongst the highest in the world, a 20-foot range taking 50-ton boats from the foreshore to the streets. It is a daily rhythm of life in a changing world. Thank you very much. So could we now have the present, the, the, um, the two slides? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so the short clip that you've just seen was taken from Hermitage Community Moorings, which you can see there on the right. It's located in one of the most challenging stretches of the tidal Thames and is home for six to 18 vessels and approximately 50 residents. The tidal Thames flows 68 miles from Teddinting Lock out to the North Sea via the Thames estuary. Changing character along the way, its primary features are very strong currents and exceptionally high tidal range. Twice a day, the tide rises to a maximum of just over seven metres, with the outbound flow to be taking between four and five hours, and the slower inbound tide up to nine hours. As the river ebbs and flows, the water and its bank provide a constantly changing relationship to the land. At high tide, the river rises to street level, in some places temporarily covering the road. At low tide, mud flats and beaches are exposed along sections of the river. Could we just put the next slide on, please, uh, Joe? Thank you very much. Um, 
The differing points of the tide, particularly between high and low water, together with the fast ebb and flow, affect, affect the daily rhythms of the tidal, uh, uh, affect the daily rhythms of people that live on the river as they emphasize the changing textures and power of the water, as it is that tightly bound to the cycles of the moon, the seasons, the prevailing winds, fluctuating weather patterns and the light. I'm just going to share with you um, some quotes um, from the people who I interviewed about this, about their relationship with the tide and their thoughts. This is from people living on barges, obviously. I know exactly what the tide is doing outside. You get used to the tidal patterns. You know where the light is coming from, from every direction. You can see the sky in the, in the west, sunrise in the east. The tide makes me very aware of what the climate is doing, what the weather is doing, what the seasons are doing, and what time of day it is. I know exactly what boats are passing outside. You get a lot of wildlife here as well. I love feeding the birds with my kids in the mornings off the side of the boat. Next quote. The excitement of the tide coming in, especially when it's a big tide, like today, for example, you just ride on the top of it with the sheer volume of water everywhere, making it choppy and turbulent experience. And then as the tide runs out, there is a slightly sad moment, followed by a feeling of calm as the boat settles down again, slowly sinking into the mud. It's a very beautiful cycle. However, living at Tower Bridge, the living on the high, living at, on the tide at Tower Bridge is not always a pleasant. A strong gusts of winds and currents pile the water into a surging maelstrom. The pontoons heave and buck, the mooring ropes whip tight. 120 foot barges bounce around like rubber ducks, spraying sheets of water over the decks. Down below, the river sprites hurl crockery to the floor, knock people off their feet, tilting the floor to 30 degrees, our own force get eight gale at sea in the city. And then just as suddenly as it began, it's over. The river gods depart and a party boat packed with tourists chugs by on a gently rolling river. This is high tide on the River Thames in London. Thank you. Should I stop sharing? That was lovely. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Sally. Yeah, that was that was that was great. Uh, it's so it, it's, we've had certain very few. Uh, real cityscapes apart from Bristol, which we've seen quite a bit of it. So it's lovely to uh, to really to really see the some muddy Thames there. Actually, <laughs> well, I think we forget sometimes that the, the the I think it's easy to think it's easy to forget how that tide is such a forceful element in the city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My my first my one of my very first jobs. He's he's, he's talking a long time ago now. Was on some, a recording in a recording studio called the Barge. Oh yes, which was on, which was in Little Venice, and it was a very strange experience to be in what felt like a perfectly normal recording studio with no windows. It suddenly moved. <laughs> it, was very, it was a very odd sensation. Uh, so Anne Marie, you're you're muted. There you Sally, go. Sally, yeah. you still living on a, a Thames boat, or have you lived on on the? Marine? <laughs> No, we left a few years, we left about three years ago, but the person who made that film is the, or put those clips together, is the person who bought the boat from us. Uh -huh. And sadly, she couldn't be here today. Um, but uh, no, I do miss it, I have to say. <laughs> There's something very special about living on water. I, pr I presume there is a really very strong sense of community. Absolutely, there is. And there are, in fact, 24 communities living on the tidal Thames um, yeah. from Teddington down to, to Wapping. So, yes. Fantastic. So thank you for that. Thank you very much indeed. We are uh, going to move on to uh, Caleb, who's there right now. Um, uh, welcome. It's great to, great to see you. Um, and uh, we've got a film from you guys to show. You want to talk about, you want to talk to us first. 
Yeah, I was, I'll talk for up to five minutes and then if you could show the film compilation that we put together. Um, I'm actually, uh, Stuart sends his apologies, but he's gone out for a daring second kayak of the day ah. to um, explore the lowest of the low tide. So we'll have to wish, wish him luck because the water level is extremely low. Um, so, At least uh, you're doing take these camera with him. Take <laughs> I shall be going out tomorrow. Our highest tide is actually here is, is actually tomorrow morning. So I'm going out kayaking tomorrow morning because I'll miss today. Thanks, thanks very much for, for, for putting, putting this on um, everyone. That's and lovely to see everyone here. Um, thank you, Sally, for your presentation. There's a lot of resonances, I think, with the, with the, with the urban high tide. Um, and um, so I'm going to start, start now. It takes me about 10 minutes to walk here from my house on the eastern side of Plymouth, a city on the southwest coast of Britain, down the cobbled back alleys of St Jude's, across the football fields and under the disused railway bridge, to loop up the ramp to the cycle track, over the dual carriageway by the Seagull Bridge to where the path twists through a narrow subway and out to a scruffy woodland area. Turn right by the apple tree that's grown up from a core someone chucked away years ago, through the scrubby vegetation round the back end of Blagden's storage compound, once a boatyard, then out into the open. And a few steps further, there it is, the River Plym estuary. I come here to be by the water at high tide. My vantage point is the southern shore of the upper estuary, known as the Lara. I stand on a narrow strip of reclaimed land whose edge has been reinforced with a gabion wall, wire baskets full of rocks, adjacent to a rusty railway line that once carried freight such as china clay and granite from Dartmoor and chemical fertilizers and nitrate of soda from Victorian factories to the nearby wharfs in Catdown and the harbour in Dead Man's Bay. Behind me to my right the estuary narrows, constrained by rocky outcrops on either side the floodwaters of the River Plym race through the gap as the twice daily tides push inland. I watch as the water rises, nibbling at the reclaimed land, each tide dislodging more of the hardcore that was laid down in the last century. Clumps of rockweed growing along the brackish shoreline sway in the current. Three cormorants sit on a floating buoy. A lone swan flies north, low across the water, heading for the A38 Marshmills interchange, where geese, mallards, herons and egrets sit out the high water beside steep reinforced river banks on the east side and curving beaches made from mining waste on the west side. This is a landscape hollowed out by extensive quarrying during the 19th century to provide infill for new land created through embankments of the estuary's many creeks, channels, bays and inlets, and for Plymouth breakwater, the massive man-made reef nearly 1500 metres long that protects shipping from storms in Plymouth Sound. During the 1970s, a further stretch of reclaimed land was established to relocate a boatyard whose water frontage had been displaced by a road improvement scheme. And more recently, a path for cycling and walking was created. Over the centuries, discharges from tin mining and China clay works have silted up the estuarine channel, so it is now only navigable by small boats at high tide. The mud is nearly 30 metres deep in certain, certain places. The layer's wide, ragged waterfront edges have been reclaimed, embanked, filled in, and built upon, and the transition zones of water and land, the marshes and swamps, have been drained, and the landscape trimmed and smoothed for human use. People have lived in this area for many thousands of years. Quarrying of the estuarine limestone cliffs during the 19th century breached an extensive cave system that spread beneath the ground to around 50 metres below sea level. Workmen revealed a fissure that was found to contain the partial skeletons of 15 hominids, upright walking early humans, estimated to stretch back at least 14,000 years along with the fossils of Ice Age woolly rhinoceroses, reindeer, hyenas and a woolly mammoth. The estuary is a rear, a drowned river valley. Since the time of these early ancestors, the sea level has risen as the planet warmed and the glaciers and polar ice sheets melted. 
The whole of the layer is now a flood warning zone where high tides coincide with a rush, water, rush of water went from the River Plym after heavy rain. I've made several short films about the area around the southern shore of the estuary in collaboration with the sound artist and filmmaker Stuart Moore, currently out on the water. And last summer, we ventured further and began to explore the, the layer of by kayak. Because the estuary is silted up and the mud so deep, we can only go out onto the water at the times of high tide. Even a neap high tide in between new, new, new and full moon requires very careful navigation to avoid bottoming out in the shallows and getting stuck. We've made a five minute video for you to watch today so you can share our experience of the Lara estuary. The first two minutes are a compilation of some of Stuart's filming from his kayak, starting with the top of the estuary where the A38 and railway line cross over the water. For people that know, know Plymouth, that's very close to Sainsbury Superstore. And then we have our one minute film poem, Flow, created with common wildflowers growing along the reclaimed southern shore in late summer and autumn. And finally, we've included a minute of our new film, Cadence, which is a work in progress that is from common, made from common wildflowers from the same area, actually gathered at high tide last summer. And we hope you enjoy the films. If you could play the film now, that'd be great. Thank you.
Hey, are you are you there? Are you ready? Hello, I'm just waiting for you to play the film. Yeah, well, I'm just uh, there. We go. Okay, brilliant. Thank you.
Thanks, everyone. That's me done. Actually, we've got a couple more minutes, so I'd, oh, love, to ask you, I'd love to ask you uh, a little bit more about those animation films and a bit about the process. They, they have an extraordinary quality to them that is both ethereal and and yet somehow feeling very solid. They're, they're lovely. Um, just wanted to, love to hear a little bit more about them. OK. Hello, Richard. Long, I haven't seen you yes, for I many know. years, but it's lovely to see you yeah. again. Um, I have many fond memories of, of uh, it must be about 20 years ago. A really long time. It probably yes. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so it basically, um, I, I cut out any details about actually making the film, but um, if you just want to hang on, I'll go and get a piece. I think we might have to save the making of for another 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 yes, session, yes. Richard. But so uh, uh, basically, we've got I've got sixteen I've got thirty five millimeter movie film for this. This is this is sort of unwanted discarded film, so it tends to get cool. This is clear film. It's used as leader, so it's just get just right. get chucked away. And, um, so coming back from a walk, these walks are quite intermittent, you know, because I live a life and. Uh, <laughs> So don't don't go down there every day. And um, but these are gathered at high tide. So it's usually when I'm not going kayaking, but Stuart is, and he's off filming. So I'm I'm doing this bit. So um, then I come back to the studio, and then I press them onto a strip of film like this, and then they have to be photographed. That's uh, that's napweed. That one. Yeah. So. Um, they have to be photographed very, very quickly because the um, colours are very fugitive, particularly on some of the plants. Um, and then what happens is that the, the film itself actually distorts laterally, so you couldn't ever pass it through a projector. Sure. Um, so it was, it was actually the colours that, that, the colour world that struck me the most, actually. There were some beautiful colours in there that were both sort of delicate and yet really quite vibrant at the same time. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Because it's 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 actually doing it very very quickly. We, we did some work in Cornwall a few years ago, and um, we used petals and flowers and leaves, but um, that was to capture them onto video on top of a light box. And again, it was actually working within minutes of actually taking the the plant material and actually capturing it photographically before it's because they're all dying. They die immediately. You sort of you take them. Um, so it's a uh, I mean, in terms of a, an area of practice, it's related to, I suppose the most well-known example would be Stan Brackage's moth light, which is a sure. like a reanimation of dead moth swings and crusty old bits of um, plant that's, that's stuck onto a strip of, of a sticky film, of, of a sticky tape. So it's a bit like a giant fly paper. Mm. So, but uh, these ones are, are very, very close to being picked. So they're, they're, the colors are still there, but you can see all the details within the petals and leaves so wonderful thank you ever so thank much you. that's really great to see and um uh, say hi to Stuart and uh, I, I will be. hopefully he hasn't got yeah. stuck Richard <laughs> in the mud <laughs> yeah, it's that, the, yeah it's the water's only about that that deep yeah. in some of the places once it gets low so I'm going to um uh, invite Jackie in now Jackie is there with us waiting Hi. Hi, Jackie. Good Hi. to see you again from yesterday. It's very exciting to be part of this project. So um, I'm going to be going back in time to 2016 when there was an exhibition held at Plymouth University Gallery uh, called Sea Swim. Um, and the exhibition was curated by Lara Goodband. Uh, the exhibition Sea Swim head above water was about the transformative qualities of being in and around the sea and one of the things that Lara was interested in doing was to involve um, Plymouth sea swimmers on uh, to be part of the exhibition and so our contributions uh, some of the guys down at Devon, Devil's Point swimming um, contributed to a sea swim diary so I'm going to read various extracts from this C 
the swim diary. Um, there were a lot of contributors to this work um, and it, it's all gonna be fed through my voice. So, so listen in. Friday, 15th of January, 8.20 a.m., sunrise, high tide, cold outside, sleet showers and bright sunshine, calm water, Laura and Jackie. We swam to the buoy and just from the left appeared a cargo vessel and tugboat, huge, huge. I've never been so close to a ship that size. We swam back. Sitting here with the sun warming my chilled fingers, toes cold and exhilarated. Arrived in time to watch the sunrise over Staben Heights, sparkling silhouette and the trees sticking up over the flat top, pearly glow of gold and then the merest tip of the sun and bright, bright lights so that I was blind when I went back into the hut to light the gas. We watched the cormorant diving and experienced a harsh sleet shower. Then all was calm and swam to buoy. Found cherry rock beneath my feet and swam back with a big grin on my face. I have so many layers on, I feel like the Michelin man. 16th of January, 2016, 9.15 a.m. As I came in sight of the sea, something catches in my chest and my heart soars at the clear air and the light on the horizon. The way the sea and sky bounce joy off each other and the still cold promise of another day, another moment such as this. As I write this, the gentle sucking sounds of high tide against the wall, so still, calm, the water and sky, still, a poem of praise. 16th of the 1st, 2016. The sea, she calms the inner essence with a sense of peace, joy, and a feeling that Mother Nature truly nurtures us in a way no other can. The ocean sings her song with calm, peace, serenity. Then her anger brings havoc to our man-made barriers. We learn so much about our universe as the waves talk to our inner spirit. Love, joy, peace, serenity. She brings us all together, like-minded souls who are touched by the beauty of the sea and tranquility cove. Saturday, 16th January, 2016. Eric, the sea temperature recording guy. The water is down below 10 degrees now and it's becoming a struggle to swim between the boys. Lovely and calm today, an occasional sunshine, which doesn't actually make me feel any warmer, but psychologically it helps. We need more chats in the water. This seems to be predominantly a female activity. Sorry about the handwriting, I have the shape. 17th of January, 2016. Grey sea graying into a white cloud, glowering across the view from the door, lapping, undulating stillness to sink into, calling, but cold at 9.7 degrees centigrade, bleak to know it will be months before it rises above 10 degrees and can only sink now till some and summer day length bring it back. Bird shouts at a droning lifeboat now in my sight from the door frame inching across and gone. Sunday, 17th of January, 2016. Considering the sea temperature is supposed to be under 10 degrees centigrade, there are a lot of us here today. Met the others and off we went for a swim. And I noticed that we all had the same swimmers on, just different vintages. Mine the oldest. Yeah. It's grey and damp, but no wind, so okay to sit and write. But I am warming my hands on a cup of warm water using Pam's nice swan mug, my fave. Oh, this is so glorious, says Agnes, who's just got out of the water glowing like a salmon. Then she tells us about stimulating the vagal nerve, 
which helps to de-stress and invigorate. She tells us that we should be getting good value from this right now. It's the rest, relax and digest nerve and de-stress. So, will I sleep well tonight? Sun's coming out through the billowy grey. Water, flat calm, and there's a path of silver across the water. But my hands are shaking now, so probably time to stop writing. Rosie says, it's very cold. Yeah, damn right. Usual chatter before we part, much sniffing and stamping of feet. Wow, it is surely beautiful here, but my hands are no longer functioning. 17th of January, 2016. Sea is lovely and calm like a sheet of glass. Temperature 9.7 degrees, absolutely freezing. Didn't even make it out to the boy today as really feeling the dark coldness of the sea. Still a great feeling though to be swimming in my pink bikini in the middle of winter. Friday, 22nd of January. Mustache as no lights on bike and the daylight is fading fast. Lovely swim at high water. In the water, when a massive sub comes out around the point, Ken says it's the new astute class. Lots of debris in the water. Saturday, 23rd of January. As I walk here, I am told variously of the sea, that it is cold, lovely, and I must enjoy or endure it. Clearly, I look at the gentle rippling on the surface and wonder how it will be, how it will meet me and I it. It is mid-tide and falling with low water at 11.30 a.m. It is probably an hour away. I notice the walk-in takes me forever as my feet mutter and complain about the cobbles. I watch them carefully and they are so tight packed to the eye, glistening an array of pinks and greys and orange hues. But to my feet, they are an experience of near pain as I lurch my way inch by inch into the water. I wonder as I do this, how I might observe how long I swim for. Is it when I am actually swimming and my feet have lost contact with the terrain? Or is it when I start my immersion inch by inch? Or is it even before that when I am changed and stepping forward with the intention? Or even when I decide to swim and organize myself to arrive here? There are six rowers silhouetted from my line of swimming sight. Their cocks is urging them and the motion of the whole boat and people reminds me of the grace of insects. The sky and sea are gray, but that hardly does it justice because it is awesomely beautiful. The geese on Drake's Island are talky, cobbled up, no doubt. I swim little, a few rolls, playing with being buoyant, and then I hit a rock, which ensures I stand again. I realise that I'm not going to stay in long and enjoy the experience of simply being in water. Jackie, I I am cold. Just give you one minute. Well, thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Now I am cold and the biomechanics of writing face compromising my desire to shiver and get going. Fleetingly, I am alone. But soon voices drift into the space and I'm aware of the intensity of my own chill. Monday, 25th of January, 10.30 a.m. Horrible grey day, arrived 10.30 a.m.-ish. Here in the sea and a huge warship going by is half tide. Feeling tired and fed up, January blues. Swim for about 10 minutes, maybe less. Strong tides, so not great conditions for a long swim. Step out of the sea, bright red, skin flushed with blood, feel amazing. Usual crowd watching over the wall, dressed in hats, scarves, etc., looking bewildered at me in a bikini. Stay and drink herbal tea, enjoying the peace and solitude, ready to take on the world. Thank you. Thank you. That was a wonderful. Um, I'm not going to pass any any questions on because we 
we do need to move on, but there's some good stuff in the chat and that was fantastic. Thank Great. Thank you. Has the book ever been published? No, it should be. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful array of voices. So talk to us about that. We'll do later on. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so moving on to Anne. Anne, are you uh, are you with us? I think yes, I'm here. I'm here. Yes, very good to be with you all. Great. Uh, I need to share my screen with you to put you up can some. Do that. You are. Uh, you have permission to do that. Thank you. Okay, that's all good. Great. Okay. Um, I'm Anne, yes, and I'm going to start really from beginning point, my obsession and my passion with the sea, which began as a child when I'd go to Aberystwyth in West Wales, which has notoriously stormy weather uh, for every holiday. I began to be really interested in this funny little structure on the left, which is a tide clock looking like it's a little person on legs and a man used to come every day to open up the glass change the pins on the clock and alter the tides and cross out on the pages on the right is that huge bank of great sea coming over the railings as as children we'd rush at high tide to catch the water dodge it and a real exhilaration of would we get wet, wouldn't we? And really wishing we would and feeling that incredible thrill. At the same time, I was given a, or I won a, a competition actually, a little instamatic camera that I took to rock pools, on the rocks, on the shore, anywhere on my walks. And those were the really, I suppose, the key beginnings. And then from there, I started, I was always thinking about the sea whilst doing other things. Um, and now I've got time to work again with my sea projects. And I work across printmaking and drawing, uh, photography and video. And I'm really fascinated and drawn and obsessed with the tide lines, the convergence of that um, materiality and temporality. Um, my work envisions exchanges between stillness and motion presence and absence and traces and edges. And during the first lockdown, I was in South Devon, March to June, and my project began uh, during walks along the same stretch of shore every day in all weathers and um, all states of tide. And I wasn't really particularly looking, hadn't formed a project then. So it became, it was very unplanned but I started like living by the tides and really looking and connecting myself, really my body, my thoughts to what was under my feet, like a real, the array of tidal intervention. And so with my camera, um, I was particularly drawn to seaweed. I'm going to put two more images now. Uh, seaweed, which was strewn across rocks and on stones, caught in crevices, um, and anything I was looking at after the high tide. Um, the more I saw of it, the more I began to really engage in its movement um, and its moods of lines. And it became like um, printing my thoughts onto and into the strands, the sort of reciprocation evolved. And they took on like bodily movement and became my figures and my characters. Um, and the one on the left, I saw as um, a very sort of humorous, playful character, quite provocative and very lighthearted. And on the right hand side, I called this one a dancer because it, it seemed very theatrical, the way it's sort of bursting onto the rock or like bursting onto a stage. Um, so it became in a way like part of a play, a theatre. And I found myself um, 
really tumbling along, catching glimpses with my camera very rapidly, my eye darting here and there. And it became like an unconscious uh, tracking. And um, I was just catching and, and in a way, sometimes I felt like I wanted to mimic their movements and it energized me. And I could hardly keep up with these characters. It was like, re it was really, really intoxicating. Um, so I gathered together um, a, a large number of these. I was also at the same time always aware of the edge because um, you know, sometimes waiting for the high tide and then for it to leave or seeing it come and play with my characters that I'd taken an image of. And then a few minutes later, say, so see the dancer had been sort of stripped of all that elegance and was just lying slumped like a piece, a little seaweed, and he, he'd gone. So I was thinking this really, um, there's always this anxiety and, and, and attention. Um, but also during videoing, I found that the seaweed can be extremely stubborn and really stick under the rock for days and days, the same piece as it flings its arms out and becomes a real sort of moving kind of drawing and person. I uh, gathered a huge amount of images and about 60, I decided to put into a uh, hand held book, just move over the images for a moment, that's fine. Um, I put them into black and white, so they had a really kind of essential, vital quality. And I'd lay them all out on the floor on mass and play about with them as one would, in a way, speak to the other, or one line would curiously move into another image and have this dialogue, or sometimes there'd be a, a, a Again, this tension between a playful one, one that's rather sort of sad looking and hidden away. So I just began putting them around and made them into this book. I also started um, printing on different qualities of paper. These are on Japanese paper, on um, tracing paper, thinking about making them larger and uh, perhaps ideas that they could work uh, with dance or uh, performance. Um, also at the same time, made a box set for people to take out the images, put them on top of each other, move them around, likewise with tracing, put line on line and decide how they wanted to see them really interact with them uh, and, and move them about. I'm just gonna give you two minutes. Oh gosh, right, okay. I moved on to salt lines and I saw that these were really dried out by the sun, depending on tide and weather. And I began to see these in tiny little crevices. And um, they were really affected uh, by, by all kinds of the wind direction. And I, I, I thought they were like a lunar landscape, but very ephemeral. Again, I moved on to making these of rearranging them, breaking them up and assembling them and making them into quite a large grid-like pattern. Now I'm going to end on this one, which is a very, very fine line of, after huge waves, huge high seas, that about two inches away, you can find this very, very taut line remaining. And I think I want to just reflect on that whole sort of period of work that there is this always the tension and particularly now when we think about how we are in climate but I also found on those that that edge um, really a sort of exuberance and quietness and a really feeling of ancient communication with the sea and the rocks and the marks in the rocks like letters and language so I felt there's always an underlying language that they were like sort of old books on the sea. So I'm continuing this work and I realized that I'm, I mean, I never get tired of rocks and seaweed and it's endless interaction. But leaving this image, I just like also that sense that the fragility with marine life, our tension, that delicacy and that huge. Um, 
tidal wave. And um, I realize that's, you know, I'm on a cyclical journey from that moment of my tide clock and my dodging waves. Thank you. Thank you, lovely. Can you just tell us very, just give us a sense very briefly of the scale of the these photographs? Well, um, some of them have, I have um, blown one up to sort of more than, it's about A1, um, some of them. And the book ones, the book is a small handheld and Yes, I've been experimenting on quite a large scale and on, on, on A1 to see how one responds to the image then, the quite powerful image from very small and intricate beginnings that can be really, really tucked away. Lovely. Thank you ever so much for joining okay. us. Thank you. Thanks. It's really nice uh, addition. There's some nice comments in the chat when you have a chance to catch up with that. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll say hello to Raquel. Thanks. Uh, Hi. Hello. Yes. Okay, so you know my name, and Raquel Rabinovich. I was born in Argentina 92 years ago. Actually, 92 years ago today. Ah, happy birthday. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I emigrated from Argentina to the US with my family in 1967. After some years in the New York City, now I live in the countryside, in the Hudson Valley, which is in upstate New York. When I look at the world around me, I am aware that there is another extraordinary world behind it that seems to me invisible. And I'm, I'm very drawn to this hidden world, which I have explored in my paintings, sculptures, and drawings during the last 60 years. Through different processes and media, I try to reveal that which is concealed emerging into view. I try to make the invisible visible. This is a paradox that has been central to my art practice. One example of my fascination with that hidden world and its emergence into view is my Hudson River project entitled Emergences, which I did over a number of years on the banks of the Hudson River. This is a series of stone sculptural installations in site specific locations, which I created at the edge of the river at low tide. By the way, the Hudson is a tidal river. The sculptures exist in a continual state of flux, being gradually concealed and revealed with the daily rising and falling of the river tides. They constantly emerge and submerge in and out of view. At high tide, the sculptures are concealed, covered by the waters, and it takes six hours for them to be gradually revealed until they are in full view at low tide. Then it takes another six hours for them to gradually submerge until being completely out of view at high tide. Well, some of the pieces over time disappear from view entirely, new pieces come into existence. For me, this echoes the story of our lives. Stones are repositories of history. For me, um, the layering in my sculptures suggests geological and cultural times. They evoke the history of the earth and humankind, and also function as metaphors for the passage of time and the ephemeral nature of existence. 
What I would like to do now is to show you images of those installations, some of them anyway. I think I did something wrong here. Um, you should be able to just click your... I, I don't see the screen anymore. Oh, okay. Can you can you see the images? No, we. I don't think you've... Oh my God. Add your screen yet? Then I have to go. How how could I? How do I get back to the screen? Um, unfortunately, I can't help you because I can't really. Hi, okay. Raquel. Oh, here we are. Okay. There we so go. Now, now you can see the image. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is one of the first pieces I did using marble. You can see the white stones. And this is almost high tide. The piece is emerging into view. And because it was a very bright day, we can see the sun making the water quite transparent. So you can see also the stones which are under the water. And then in this other piece, we can see another configuration. This is in beacon, and I use here field stone. So notice how wide the river is. This is the other shore, and this is a bridge connecting one side to the other. The river flows from north to south through the Hudson Valley, originated in upstate New York, and then ending in New York City in the Atlantic Ocean. The stones I used came from local quarries, sometimes from the site itself, but at other times it's a mix of both. This is another view of that piece in which you can see is partly emer emerging and partly submerged. And also for me, it was very important the surrounding areas because everything became part of the sculpture or the installation. And that changed not only with the time of the day or the seasons, but also with every specific site. I needed assistance with the proper equipment to leave one stone at a time. Here, for instance, we have another installation in Kowawisi Park. This piece is emerging into view from high tide. This will be mid tide. And now you can see it in total view and low tide. Again, the surrounding environment makes this very specific. So I need assistance with the proper equipment. This will be what I need, a crane. The crane will lift one stone at a time and place it in the right spot. This is an assistant here. The crane lifted one of the stones from a pile and is in the process of dropping the stone in what will be the right assigned spot. It was a very special kind of visual communication between the assistants and me. I develop a system of signs with my hands for them to understand where I wanted the stones to be placed. But many times, <clears throat> of course, I would change my mind and we have to make adjustments. Usually I would start from a very rough sketch, which I soon ignore because what I, it prevailed for me was the vision of my, the installation in my mind. So the stones were piled up in mounds, layer upon layer. The construction of the sculptures had to take place at the very beginning of low tide, which meant we could only work for about two hours at a time. After a piece was completed, I used to stay 
for six hours, observing its gradual emergence or submergence. I was like a detective searching for clues for Riverside suitable for my project. I remember getting leads pointing in that direction from ecologists, stone quarrymen, fishermen, architects, poets, filmmakers, and photographers, also riverboat captains. The sculptures were installed <clears throat> in public parks in the context of nature, not in the context of art. Visitors to the parks have different responses when encountering them. For some, they are art, for others, just a bunch of stones. This is Nayak Park. <clears throat> Here, <clears throat> we can see the piece emerging from high tide into view. Until here, we can see the completed piece at low tide. The, the stones have different textures, different colors. This is called diabase, different surroundings. Raquel, I don't want to interrupt, but I'm going to yes. give you two more minutes. Yes. How many minutes? Two minutes. Oh, only. Wow. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, every time one sees the sculptures, they're different, as you can tell. And this reminds me of Heraclitus' famous quote, you cannot step into the same river twice. We can also say, you cannot see the same sculpture twice. Many years ago, I was visiting the magnificent ruins of Machu Picchu in Peru. These were the stones, the stone ruins of an ancient city <clears throat> from the time of the Incas. I spent one magical night at the ruins, contemplating them un under the full moon. And at dawn, they disappeared from view under the clouds, but gradually the clouds lifted and Machu Picchu came into view again. Little I knew at the time that I, a seed was planted in my mind from that experience and that it would give birth more than 20 years later to my Hudson River project. Although this time it was the river tides and not the clouds that cover the stones. I only became aware of this correlation during an interview I had a few years ago in which I talk about my visit to Machu Picchu. It was quite a revelation to me as I was not conscious of this correlation when I began my project. So thank you for sharing my project with you. Thank you so much for sharing it. It's something quite extraordinary and beguiling about this work it, it uh, thank you thank you it seems to sit on a liminal edge between kind of completely natural forms and yet something that is very thought through and designed yes so thank you very much for sharing it with us it's been oh, welcome very welcome happy to share with you all of you thank you so much thank you thank you <clears throat>